We are live with Discovery Adventures. So welcome. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Jeff Schroeder, and I will be one of the hosts today. We will also be joined by Anna Villani, and they will be talking about taxidermy today in our Discovery Adventures. And Marcy is going to help us from behind the scenes as well. So welcome, everyone. Now, I did want to talk a little bit here and share my screen. Let you all know that it is Black History Month at the Field Museum in February, and we're celebrating that. And this actual presentation is a little bit of that celebration as well. So we're going to be talking about the work of Carl Cotton, who is an African-American taxidermist. And that is, again, part of our celebration. If you're interested in learning more about Black History Month at the museum, um, feel free to head to one of the web addresses down there at the bottom. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Anna, and they will tell you more about Carl Cotton. Thank you so much, Jeff. So today I am actually in the physical Field Museum building, and we're going to be surrounded by the types of animals we have in the building. Um, I'm really glad you're all here to join us today. Raise your hand wherever you are, whatever you're doing, if you like animals. I know I really love animals myself. And a lot of people don't think about animals being in the museum, but the museum is full of animals, especially museums like the Field Museum, but they're not alive animals like at the zoo or the aquarium. They are taxidermy animals. And so that's gonna be the through line of our presentation today. We're gonna talk about what taxidermy is and how it's made. We're also going to talk about who Carl Cotton is and the types of work he did on taxidermy, the types of animals that he worked on. And then we're going to talk about why taxidermy is important, why it's in the museum, and those lasting impacts of Carl Cotton and other taxidermists in the field. So the first thing we want to talk about is like what is taxidermy. So I've got some animals behind me. There's some birds, there's some fish, there's some insects. You might have seen bigger animals if you're in the museum like elephants or lions. When you see those animals, are they the same as a real animal? We're going to have a trivia question that Jeff's going to help us pull up on the screen. And I want to see what everybody thinks about what parts of these animals, if any parts, are real, or if they're from the same animal parts that we would see on a wild animal in nature. So I almost got the trivia question up there. So there's some different options. Do you think that the skin is maybe from the real animals? The eyes? The insides? Could it be everything from those animals? Or is it maybe nothing? from those animals. What does everybody think? All right, and we've got lots of responses coming in. And just to remind everyone, I kind of forgot at the beginning, but if you have questions for Anna or for us, please put them in the Q&A. If Anna maybe asked for participation, then you would use the chat more for that. We've got these coming in. And it looks like so far, oh, we've got a lot of people saying that the skin yeah, that's definitely the most popular answer. And that is very oftentimes true. So, and it honestly does depend on the animal. So we're going to talk about all of these types of things. So most people said the skin and most often the skin is real. So I have a skin right here. If anybody wants to guess what animal it's from, you can type it into the chat, but you can see that it has fur on the outside, just like we see fuzzy animals, the inside, is tanned, it's like leather. So if you've ever had a leather shoe, a leather glove, a leather bag, that's, or even different sports balls are made out of um, animal skins, right? I'm getting snake, so, squirrel, badger, um, a, a snake or a long squirrel, an otter. <laughs> <laughs> I like a snake or a long squirrel. It's like a little funny when it's empty, right? And that's why the art of taxidermy is so important because if we saw this outside, this does not look like a regular animal that we normally see day to day. But it is a squirrel, that is exactly right. You might've recognized that bushy tail, but it does seem extra long when it's flattened out. When they're alive, they might fold up a little more. So the skins are always gonna be real in general when you're in the museum if you're looking at mammals or birds. 
they have a skin that's really easy to preserve. But some parts of the body don't preserve really well. I see that nobody picked eyeballs. Mm. Nobody thinks the eyes are real. You're exactly right. The eyes are never, ever, ever going to be real. And we actually have some of the fake eyes that they use in taxidermy right here with me today. Does anybody in the chat want to guess why we can't use the real eyeballs? What would happen if we just had somebody's dead eyeball lying around? Oh, let's see. I feel like that might be a little The says a little strange. Yeah, they stink, they rot, they'll mold. Oh, <laughs> they get moldy. Those are, <laughs> yeah, they get really gross. We're all on the right track. They'll rot, they'll get stinky. Like mold will grow on them and help decompose them. It'll be really bad. Yeah, so eyes don't last forever. So there's a lot of different fake eyes that people will make to look like different animals. So you can see there's different eyes in here. They might be different colors. The pupils might be different shapes. And there's of course different sizes because just like every animal looks different, they all have different eyeballs for their different purposes and lifestyles. And some of the really old ones, like this one here, they actually were painting on the inside so you can see on the inside of this little glass um, dome that they painted the inside, but the outside, because it's glass, is really shiny. So it reflects the light just like our eyes do. Our eyes do that because they're like covered in moisture. So that's what reflects the light for us. Hey, Anna. They're pretty cool eyeballs. Yeah. We had, yeah. um, did, I'm not sure if you talked a lot about this. We did have a question right at the beginning of what is a taxidermist? Oh yeah, that's a great question. So a taxidermist is somebody who is gonna be preparing animal skins for preservation. So as we're talking about all these different things, taxidermy has a lot of different definitions. Some people would call this taxidermy and some people wouldn't because some people think that taxidermy needs to be mounted to look lifelike, like that bird behind me. But at the most basic definition, it's any preserved natural, animal, um, creature, and that can include people. Some people consider mummies to be a form of taxidermy. So taxidermist is anybody that's working with this stuff. But sometimes it gets a little confusing because some animals are more replicated than mm -hmm. these ones. And we'll talk about that as we go through them. But we talk about the outside of the squirrel. So I do want to get to the inside of the squirrel as well. Because did anybody think the insides are real? Some people thought the insides were real. The insides are not real because just like those eyeballs, they would rot and decay. So there's a lot of different types of structures. And so a taxidermist, in addition to preparing that skin and preserving it, they're gonna be building interesting structures, maybe like this one, which is something that might go on the inside of a squirrel. And they use different materials across time as well. So this is using wood shavings that have been kind of forced into place by being wrapped around with string. And then this one is very modern. You can actually buy these online. And this is made of styrofoam or some other type of foam that's cast from a mold. So they can make a mold in the shape of an animal and keep filling it with foam and make a lot of these. So for animals that are really common, like squirrels, you might want a bunch of these. But if you need a really unique animal, like an antelope that most people don't have around them, you might want to then custom build to your unique animal needs. Mm -hmm. And I'll bet we've had to have done that. <laughs> yeah. Let's do that. Oh, and somebody I think asked if you ever use clay. That's a great question. Clay is really, really heavy. So sometimes they would use clay to make something like this, and then they would make a mold around that, and then they would cast that again with something that's more like paper mache that's going to be lighter. Um, but they do sometimes use clay to make those sculptures. But on the inside of an animal, it's really difficult because it makes it really heavy and it's hard to get it to keep its shape. That was a good question. Yeah. And we did. There's any other specific. Oh, yeah. What you got? Oh, sure. We had another question, and you may be going to cover this, but someone was asking, and I think this is a question on a lot of people's minds where do we get the animals for the taxidermy? Yes. That is a great question. So it really depends. We have thousands of animals in the museum and they come from a bunch of different sources. Sometimes our animals die in the wild and then they're donated to the museum. Sometimes they die at zoos and aquariums and are donated to the museum. 
some of them are killed in the wild and brought back to the museum. And sometimes that's done as a specific collecting expedition. So for example, we have scientists that are studying all the different species of rats in the Philippines. In order to know if something is a new species, we need to bring it back and put it in the collection. Whenever people are collecting animals, they have to make sure we're doing it in ethical and sustainable ways, because of course we don't want to ever harm the wild populations. We want to make sure that we have the resources in the building so we can continue to understand and protect the wild populations. And animals like the elephants, those were hunted in the wild, but that was 125 years ago. So today that is not an animal that we would collect in the way that it was 100 um, years ago. Not 125, that's how old the building is. The elephants are like 106. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Another um, answer that was pretty popular, the second most popular answer after the skin was everything. And there is one category of animal where they do keep everything and that is the insects. So when we have an insect that we wanna preserve, they are able to keep the whole thing. They're pretty unique because the skeleton is on the outside of their body. So even if their insides are drying out and getting weird, it's kind of protected by this exoskeleton. And because we keep them in a museum where we're trying to limit any animals that might try to decompose them and eat them, they're pretty safe. But they keep it on a pin so that we can handle it safely without damaging it because they are kind of brittle, which means it break easily. Kind of like if you step on a bug and it crunches like a tortilla chip, just easy to break. <laughs> and Carl Cotton is such a cool person who we're going to talk about soon because we've covered, I think, the gist of most of these things. Um, but we'll talk about nothing next, the nothing category of taxidermy. But Carl Cotton worked on mammals, worked on bugs, worked on plants, which is an example of nothing. So sometimes with taxidermy, there might be some things where nothing is real. And this is an example of where we used, let me grab the other half, a mold. So in this mold, they were able to capture the impression of a leaf. Maybe you've put a leaf into Play-Doh or clay and seen something like this. Or if you've ever seen a fossil of a plant, it might kind of look like this too. And then they're able to use, it's a pretty heavy mold, that to create a copy of it. Now this hasn't been painted. There's a lot of artistry that goes into taxidermy too, but it recaptures the shape, the size, and all the details like the veins on that leaf. And that's not just used for plants. There are some categories of animals where we're gonna mold the actual animal's body. They're gonna pose the dead animal. And sometimes they might even do it with a live animal and they mold around it. And then they're gonna be able to cast that copy because it's relatively easy to work with some flexible animal skins like birds or mammals. But there's other categories of animals that are a little tricky oh, to work that's with. Expensive. And just- because yeah, we. Yeah, Jeff's gonna pull up a picture of this animal and if anybody knows what it is, uh, you can type it into the chat. We've had some people asking if there are animals that can't be preserved. So the different tricks to doing this, let me bring this up and let's see what we got here. Yeah, all right. I'm gonna go ahead and move to our next animal. All right. So you're all gonna see here, we've got, this is a picture of Carl Cotton, a couple pictures of him working on a taxidermy mount of an animal. I want everyone to take a look at that and feel free to chat if you think you know what type of animal that is that Carl Cotton is working on. I see people raising their hands, let's see. Yeah, I'm looking at, it looks like he's making that mold on the left there. And then he's got the creature almost finished on the right. There was a question also in the chat, does the museum have a taxidermist that works there? And yes, we do have um, several, we do have people who work on different uh, specimens and study skins. And it looks like Anna is back. What I'm gonna do is, let's see, in the chat, Anna, I'm gonna, while you're getting ready here, we've gotten mm -hmm. some responses to this. We've uh, got a turtle, a tortoise, a snapping turtle, an alligator snapping turtle, Bowser from Mario, I'm assuming. Um, 
yeah, so we've gotten a lot of good responses. I'm going to stop sharing so you can talk with us here. Yeah, thank you everybody for taking a look at that. That is indeed an alligator snapping turtle related to other turtles and tortoises. And it's a pretty impressive looking animal. And so as you saw in those historical photographs, um, Carl Cotton created this mount, but this is not the actual turtle's skin. What it is, is a cast from a mold, which you could see in that picture. And somewhere on my cart, oh, here it is. I have another mold too. So this is an example of one of those types of molds. So you might recognize what this is too. If anybody has an idea of what animal might be this shape, you can go ahead and type that as well. <laughs> and you can see they actually would have to carefully paint in layer by layer the different colors with a material called celluloid, which is like a plastic. And so they would very carefully recreate the exact appearance of the animal using molds and many, many layers of colors. Yeah, we've getting, we're getting an overwhelming number of uh, snake responses for that, Anna. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. It is indeed a snake. And I hope you can all see this alligator snapping turtle. Okay, is that a decent view, Jeff? Yes, I can see that turtle quite well in its watery environment there. Yeah, <laughs> it's a pretty impressive animal. So one of the most amazing things about Carl Cotton is a lot of taxidermists specialized in a type of animal. So when people were asking if there's people that make taxidermy in the museum today, there is, but not as often to go on display. So a lot of people, they actually are working in the collection making study skins. So you might have seen maybe in a museum an animal that looks less lifelike, maybe like a little chipmunk superhero. Um, where their eyes are full of white cotton, not those beautiful glass balls that look so lifelike. So we have people that work in the mammal collection or the bird collection, and they prepare specimens that are gonna be used for research. But when Carl Cotton was at the museum um, from the 40s up until 1971, he was working for exhibitions and he worked on all types of animals. People usually specialize in one type of animal, like Carl, Akeley really liked mammals. He also worked a lot on birds, but did not like birds. <laughs> and, um, but Carl Cotton, he, he seemed to also love reptiles. He had a lot of pet snakes at home. I don't know if anybody else has pet snakes at home. Carl Cotton did too. And he loved reptiles. He also worked on birds. He worked on a lot of insects. He was working on pretty much every category of animal, which was really impressive. And he was doing an awesome job of it. This technique of making these casts was called the Walters method because it was invented by somebody named Leon Walters. And Carl Cotton was one of the people that really perfected that and continued to make it have a strong foothold in the museum collections today. I'm gonna stand up a little bit now because I'm a little afraid this alligator snapping turtle is gonna try to eat me. <laughs> Some of our, uh, our guests are thinking that too, Anna. They're a little worried about you. Yeah. We also had a- That's fair. <laughs> from, this is- from Mercedes and they were asking about fish. If that's similar, you'd have to cast a fish. That is a great question. Kind of, yes. So fish are really weird. And actually let's go walk over here because I know there's a fish this way. So with fish, fish have run a wide range of taxidermy options. So sometimes people were casting fish much like we saw. Sometimes people actually skinned the fish and mounted it, but they would usually dry out and not look really good after a long time. And sometimes they would use the real fins, but like a wooden painted body. So there were a lot of different options when it came to fish taxidermy. We can see this historical photo of Carl Cotton working on the salmon um, where he's painting it. This looks like it is a model that is not the real body, but sometimes with those, they were using the real fins. I'm not sure about this one. But if you're ever in the museum and looking to go on a journey through Carl Cotton's taxidermy, there's actually a whole map that highlights where you're gonna be able to find it throughout the exhibits. And then when you're in the exhibits, you'll see these signs to indicate where his work is. And we often have really cool historical photographs of him working on these animals. Were there any other questions, Jeff? Yeah, we have had a few others. Um, and we were talking a little bit about that alligator snapping turtle, right? And Greg had a question, how do you make a mold from a live animal? Yeah, 
that is a great question. I've never seen it done myself, but I've heard legends that maybe they were using some type of straw, like a snorkel, so that the animal could breathe while they were casting it. But it's really fun to try to dig into the historical archives because a lot of the old processes that people used to use to make taxidermy or make replica plants, we don't have all of the details. But that's why as a museum, we love recording all the information we do have so we can try to recreate all of these different methods if we ever wanted to. But yeah, I don't exactly know for sure. My best guess is some type of snorkel straw, but I encourage you to do some archival research and see what you can find as well. Yeah, awesome. And then we had one more here. <clears throat> um, it might pertain slightly to that beetle you showed us earlier. Someone was asking, do you have live animals in the field museum? <laughs> That's a great question. So when we are preparing our animals, to go into the collection, they're already dead, um, but we use the help of some live animals. So we not only keep the skins in the collection and sometimes on display, I don't know if there's any near me, we have skeletons. We'll probably see a skeleton eventually. But in order to clean up those skeletons, we do use the help of some animals. So they'll open up an animal's body, they take out all of the fleshy part, and then somebody is gonna tan the skin and prepare that, but they're gonna put all of that muscular body with a skeleton on side, inside a tank of our live animals, the flesh-eating beetles, and they're awesome. They work for free food and they eat all of that dead rotting flesh, which cleans up the skeleton, which makes it ready to go for us to display in an exhibit or for us to keep in the collection. So we love the flesh-eating beetles. It's a pretty stinky area. That's why we don't really have it on public display because it smells like rotting flesh all the time. Um, there's also two fish tanks in the museum, so there's some fish too. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, if that's all the questions for right now, I'm going to walk to another area where Carl Cotton had the biggest impact proportionally of all the animal categories. Um, and while I do that, um, Jeff, if you want to pull up the picture of the Nile Marsh diorama, it's a really cool area that we are not going to be able to make it to today but it really showcases all of the different types of things that Carl Cotton worked on because it has plants that he made replicas of and plants that he preserved. It has lots of birds. There's a lot going on. So Jeff can talk more and answer more questions. I'm gonna walk. Yeah, so this is, <clears throat> you'll see on the screen now, this is the Birds of the Nile Marsh diorama, one of my favorites in the museum. And if you look at this, you could almost imagine you're there, right? It's hard to tell what's the background and what is actually you know, painted and what is real here and taxiderm. So Carl Cotton created this diorama and, and there's actually a little exhibit in the Brooker Gallery in the museum where it shows a video of some of the creation of this. It was really spectacular. He crafted all sorts of things. He actually laid down the ground and created the mud he actually used some real plants for these reeds you can see growing on the side behind the big bird there and then um, dried out. And then of course the birds taxidermed over different mounts. So feel free to chat if you have any questions about this diorama or are curious about any of the birds in there. I can tell you about a couple of them. The big stork looking thing, the gray one on the right is a shoebill stork. You might be able to guess why if you look at its bill or its beak. And then the cranes on the left with those fancy things on the head, those are crowned cranes. You can see all sorts of little birds. The detail is just amazing that Carl Cotton was able to do here. Let me see. Yeah, so we had some questions here. Are the beaks real? Usually, as far as I know, beaks on the birds do preserve. And so I believe these are real for these birds. Um, the hair on top of the crown crane is actually like a feather. So yeah, that does preserve. I would guess that that is real as well. An oyster catcher, Jamie, yeah, good question. It looks a lot like an oyster catcher. I'm not sure um, it's something I'd have to look up. I don't think that's an oyster catcher. I think it may be some kind of a plover, but it is a, yeah, it's a similar little bird there. Great questions about that diorama. Is there some kind of way to preserve penguins? Yes, we actually do have a penguin diorama and you can preserve penguins the same way as another bird, just the skin and the feathers on the outside over a mold. 
Um, bird legs can be preserved. Yep, so those legs are very likely real of those birds. Lots of great observations and questions about this diorama. I'm trying to think if there's any other cool birds in here. You can see some egrets, the white ones in the back, and looks like some little birds in the reeds there. So Carl Cotton just used an incredible amount again of detail just to show every creature, try to make this look like you could be there to almost like take you there to that place and feel transported to it. So Anna's going to talk more about that and about Carl Cotton here. So I'm going to transition back to Anna. Stop sharing. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, so here we are now in the bird hall. So there are hundreds of birds throughout this entire area and about one in four of them, 25% are made by Carl Cotton. So this is a really amazing part of the museum to think about the impacts of just one person and all of the animals that we see here today. It's really, really hard to go through the field museum and not see something that was affected by Carl Cotton. So he's had a very big impact and pretty much no matter what I turn to, if I go look at birds over here, there's still birds that Carl Cotton worked on over in this case. And there's an example of a skeleton. I told you we'd see one eventually. There's always skeletons. Yeah. yeah. And so I wanna talk about kind of the last thing about why we have taxidermy in the museum. So we've talked a lot about how it's made and how Carl Cotton made it and the impacts he's had in the museum, but also the fact that we have all these animals in museums period, a lot Oh, looks like we might be having a little bit of a technical difficulty here. So um, Marcy, I don't know if you want to spotlight me and I can go ahead and share the screen until Anna gets back on. Let's see. Yeah, I think Anna maybe got a little too far into the bird exhibit. And they let Oh, that looks like Anna's coming back on. Okay. Oh, sorry, my <laughs> computer died, but I have a phone, so I'm still here. Hooray. Yeah. <laughs> I know that was kind of a dramatic transition. <laughs> but the reason that we really appreciate having these animals in the museum, right, is these are animals that are going to be around forever. I mentioned the elephants that are on display in the main hall. Those have been in the museum for over 100 years. These things should last forever. And... For some, time, for some animals, this might be the only way that people have to see them, whether it's because they're endangered or extinct in the wild or because they might live in an area that you're not able to get to. I don't know about you, but I have never seen a kookaburra or what else is over here? That's not a toucan. It kind of looks like a toucan. These are hornbills, but I've never seen a hornbill alive. Um, so it's a really amazing resource to inspire and educate people because people do come to places like museums to connect to nature and wild spaces to learn more, whether it's the general public or as a researcher who's trying to compare and understand relationships between these animals and the environment they live in. So we really appreciate the impact the taxidermists have had to be able to make these experiences possible. And I know we're running towards the end of time. So if anybody else has questions that Jeff, we have time to throw out there, I'm here for them. Um, someone asked, is there a dodo bird? Oh, that's a great question. I think the dodo that's on display is a replica and it's at the other end of the bird hall. So there is a replica of a dodo here. And kind of along those lines, Anna, someone asked how long you can preserve something for because I know dodos went extinct quite a while ago. So it's difficult to preserve something well that long, but how long can we preserve things for? That's a great question. So we don't, at some level, we don't totally know, right? So we have animals and even tissue samples today that we like to think we're able to keep forever. Of course, like DNA is a good example of something that falls apart over time. But a lot of the animals, even if they're a few hundred years old, we can still find things that have DNA in it. And if we collect an animal today, we can very intentionally put tissue in like really cold storage so we can keep them, um, that tissue hopefully for forever. So hopefully forever to be determined. And if you're keeping it in really controlled conditions, like in a museum where we're making sure it doesn't have too much light or weather damage, that helps it last longer too. Okay, great. 
Um, let's see, we had a couple other questions here. Oh, someone was asking, um, what is the biggest animal, replica or real, that you have on display? I think it's the whale in the ceiling. I think it's the right whale is the biggest that we have out. Oh, and Maximo, I saw somebody put that. Maximo is extinct. And of course, the Sioux is also pretty big. But as far as like modern animals, the whale, for sure. Okay, someone asked if there's a falcon. There are falcons. I think they're this way. You might see some other interesting birds on the way to the falcons. It's on ostrich, wow. Yeah. yeah. So we have in the bird hall, as Anna's traveling, we have all sorts of birds. Birds of prey like falcons and owls, penguins. And there's penguins for whoever wanted to see some penguins. We got them. <laughs> it's so real, I can almost hear the birds, Anna. I know, they've got all the sounds on. Here are the Falcons. And the Caracara. I love Caracaras. Oh, Caracaras. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah. Looks like that Falcon's caught something. It does. So that Falcon seems to have caught maybe some type of duck or water bird. But, um, one of the great things too is taxidermy can show us what it would be like when these animals were alive and moving. Like we also saw in that Nile marsh bird diorama, it recreates their habitat or their behavior, which is really cool. We can kind of lose ourselves looking at some of this type of taxidermy art. I love it. Awesome. All right. Anna, do you have time for one or two more questions? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, uh, let's see here. How about, we have someone who really wants to know how birds get their names. You know, that's a really great question because there's some pretty silly bird names out there. Usually when the person is like, I think it's a person that writes the description of the animal usually gets to come up with a scientific name. I don't really know if they also come up with a common name or if people just decide the common names for themselves, but it's a great question. <laughs> But yeah, if you can identify a new species, you can try to name something too. Cool. And then one more here. Are the animals all from America or are there species from around the world? That's a great question. There are species from around the world in the museum. And even some of the ones we've been past just now. So like that ostrich lives in Africa. Those penguins lived in Antarctica. Um, some of those other birds, I don't remember. I think the hornbill probably lives in Africa based off of Zazu being a hornbill, but we've seen a lot of birds already. Birds all over the world. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thanks. Well, the only other question, and I don't know if we can answer this for sure right now, and because this is one I've gotten too, is can we make the, unex the extinct animal like a dodo uh, unextinct? That's a great question. And there's scientists that are like trying to figure that out right now. We think it's gonna be more likely for animals that went extinct recently. For example, the passenger pigeon was a bird that lived in the United States not that long ago, and giant flocks that would block out the sun. And that is something that we have a lot of material for and the genetics for that we might be able to bring back much more easily even than a mammoth. And a mammoth would be much more easy than the T-Rex, but it's definitely still an area of exploration. Awesome. Well, this has been lots of fun. So we are going to go ahead and finish up here. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, you can find more events like this at www.fieldmuseum.org slash events. And I'm gonna share a screen and show a little bit of this so people know where to find our different things. All right, we'll go past some of Carl's work here. Again, Sierra Nile Marsh. Elephants that Carl Akeley did, different Carl. And next week, you'll be able to join us. Anna, again, will be joining us and talking about what is a pangolin. This beautiful little creature here, so cute. This is a pangolin. We're going to learn more about it next week. So be sure to join us next week, same time, and 1 o'clock Central Time on Tuesday. And we will also be talking about these creatures here.
Anna, any final thoughts? Thank you all for joining us today. I hope to see you all again soon. Um, if you're in the museum, definitely say hi. And until we meet again, take care, have fun, stay safe and stay curious. Bye everybody. Bye.